Today I'm going to tell you a story that doesn't talk about bipolar disorder, and I'm not going to mention mitochondria, so I'm going to break two big rules at this meeting. So I'm sorry about that ahead of time. But I am going to tell you a story that I think is very useful and informative and connects the dots a little bit for where we're trying to go. So schizophrenia. So there's lots of risk factors for schizophrenia. The genetic risk for schizophrenia breaks into this pyramid. Most of the genetic risk is single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's like 278 of them. To see that, you need hundreds of thousands of patients and all kinds of fancy genetics analysis. Then there's another band that are copy number variants, and at the very top, there's these very rare mutations that are highly penetrant, and these are sort of the, the genetic risk factors that set you up to maybe have other risk factors that are environmental or bioenergetic or whatever to tip you over into having a brain that's very sick or has severe mental illness. An example. This is the uh, Scottish cohort that is a carrier of the disc mutation. So each one of the people on the pedigree that has a little asterisk next to them is a carrier of this mutation. It's very rare. There's only two families in the world that I know of. There's an American family with one proband and this family with like 21 or 17 carriers. I haven't added it up recently. And seven of these patients have schizophrenia. So they're like, aha, we're going to name this gene disrupted in schizophrenia, DISC. But when you look carefully at the pedigree, 11 of those carriers have a severe mood disorder. If I reviewed this paper, I would have crushed them for that, right? It should have been called disrupted and severe mental illness. So our best smoking gun for genetic risk for schizophrenia is actually a better risk factor for mood disorders. So let that sink in. That's a huge problem. And it's a huge problem from the standpoint of thinking about diagnostic entities. I got in trouble when I was chairing NPASS for saying out loud to the committee while we're reviewing grants, gosh, these diagnoses are actually not that useful. We need something else. And I get a call the next day, oh, you shouldn't say that, Dr. McCollum Smith. So another story about diagnoses, medical students have to take shelf exams. They're always asking me about the DSM and these questions they need to know. I'm like, it never leaves my shelf. It's a paperweight. <laughs> I keep getting in trouble for that, too. The, the director calls me up. You can't tell medical students that. The dean's going to get mad at us. We're going to get bad reviews. They're going to fail a shelf exam. So I'm usually getting in trouble. What is this slide? This is a, a, a table from a, a review article from a number of years ago where I argued that there's a whole bunch of ways to break the brain and get mousy schizophrenia. So these are all animal models, amphetamines, NMD antagonists, taking a sort of probe and messing up the hippocampus, all right? And what is mousy schizophrenia? Well, you can't assess animals. To, are they hearing ultrasonic chirps? I don't know, right? It's really hard. But you have proxies for this. Prepulse inhibition, memory deficits, locomotor hyperactivity, which is thought to be sort of a, a model of psychosis. You can break the brain all these ways and basically get the same phenotype. What in the world's going on with that? That just cements the argument that these diagnostic entities aren't so useful sometimes. So I started with that rant so I could tell you this rant. So if you take all the genetic risk for schizophrenia, all those SNPs, all those genetic sort of markers that you need hundreds of thousands of patients, and you funnel them down and, can, and you ask, can we say something about them? Most of those SNPs come down to synapses. Synaptic stuff, stuff that invol is involved with healthy synapses during development. 60, 70% of the SNPs can easily be sort of argued that they're important for synaptic function. This is a pathway analysis. The details aren't important. This is not my work. This is someone else's work. Synaptic transmission and signaling, synaptic transmission and signaling, response to stimulus, signaling, 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 okay? So the idea that comes from that is that if you have a brain that has broken synapses during development and you grow it up, at some point, bad things are going to happen. Perhaps you get schizophrenia, perhaps you get a mood disorder or whatever. So we decided to study a model of broken synapses during development. This is a mouse that's the GRIN1 knockdown mouse. And this is not my mouse, this is Amy Ramsey's mouse. She's at the University of Toronto. She has some colleagues in the room. And this is a really interesting mouse because it's not missing its receptors, it just has fewer receptors all through development. And it's a viable model. So th these animals grow up, they can be assessed. And all this stuff on the screen, this is the sort of mousy as assessment of schizophrenia, prepulse inhibition, working memory, locomotor activity, and these mice have it all. They have all the things that are sort of endophenotypes of severe mental illness, okay? And these are adult animals we're talking about. So these animals grew up with not enough NMDA receptors, 
and they have that mousy schizophrenia phenotype. So what we did with this is we asked the question, what could be going on underneath that? And we did a series of sort of bioinformatics studies. There's not time to get into that. And this led to an idea that there's perhaps a deficit of bioenergetic function in these animals. And what's on the screen now is a combination of proteomics and some transcriptional studies. And we basically found that the glucose transporters and the monocarboxylate transporters, the expression of these genes, is significantly decreased in the brains of these mice. Now, at the time, I liked the monocarboxylate transporter because it transports carboxylates, like lactate. And I had been studying lactate and things like that. What I realized later is it also transports small ketones. So that was a nice tie-in. At any rate, the question is, can we identify any drugs or repurpose any drugs in these animals that reverse this deficit? Can we perhaps increase glucose uptake or sort of reverse this deficit and sort of get at some of these symptoms? One of the ways we went at this is if you think about schizophrenia and severe mental illness, we have a way to help you a little bit if you're hearing voices. We can throw antipsychotics at a patient. They're, they're effective. They're side effects. What we really don't have any treatments for are the cognitive deficits. And those are the most profound and really most awful side effects we see in this illness. When I staff the emergency room and I have to tell a parent that their child has bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, that's, that's a terrible thing to have to do. That's like telling somebody they have cancer. That's awful. And so the question is, can we come up with a test of cognitive function in the animals? This is a puzzle box assay. This tests executive function and problem solving. This is a pretty higher order, very difficult animal study to do. We fed these animals pioglitazone. This fell out of our bioinformatics screen as a drug that could reverse the sort of omics sort of signature we saw in these animals. And on this puzzle box assay, the bottom two panels, we've got vehicle, pioglitazone, and pioglitazone reversed or restored cognitive function for this sort of advanced sort of neuroplastic activity in these animals. So we really like this as, a, as an interesting proof of principle that, gosh, if you have an animal model of broken synapses, so they've, they've grown up through childhood, they're now adult animals, it is possible to restore this. Now, important differences, these animals don't have a background of all the SNPs that are genetic risk for schizophrenia, a lifetime of stress, a lifetime of medications that are perhaps hurting their brains. Of course, no good idea goes unpunished. Somebody had already thought of this and trialed pioglitazone and schizophrenia. This is not my work either. They didn't drill down very far. They just did the pans negative scale, so they don't really get into the, gosh, does it specifically help these detailed cognitive things? And it was a promising lead and an interesting idea. We're beating the drum that if you grow a brain with broken synapses through development, whether it's genetic risk or whatever, that there's an intermediate phenotype. It's a phenotype that you can't trace back to the genetics. So the genetic risk for schizophrenia does not have a bunch of mitochondrial gene, risk genes in it. There's like one or two little things that might hint that. So we think there's an intermediate phenotype in these illnesses that's, that's a phenotype of bioenergetic dysfunction. And that's a big umbrella. That includes mitochondria, glycolysis, all the things we've been hearing at this meeting. So I think that's my, uh, I think that's my last slide. I'm gonna stop there, thanks.